Yeah, you know, I uh, texted my buddy this morning. I told my wife, I'm like, hey, I'm driving. So I asked her to text. I said, hey, listen, text my buddy. He's a pastor in Oklahoma City. I said, uh, tell him that we're praying for his service this morning. And I said, especially pray for our service. We have a guest speaker. Yeah. <laughs> could, could be 50-50. So <laughs> she said, no, don't say that. But, you know, the truth is I enjoy being able to come up here and communicate the gospel. I enjoy it. It genuinely brings joy to me. This morning I want to talk about something really, really simple. And uh, the reason I like talking about simple things, I'm simple. <laughs> That's pretty simple. So, uh, but the truth is, I believe you can see God in everyday things. Like literally, Jesus Christ, when he came to the earth, he wasn't out here trying to be the greatest theologian of all time. He was Theo and theologian. So he didn't need to be everything that we thought he should be, right? The Pharisees were doing a pretty good job of messing that up. So he came to look different. And so I think in the church world today, I think a lot of times too many people simply try to overcomplicate the gospel. It's good news. I can get good news by just telling me, hey, David, I want to take you fishing. Good news. <laughs> I'm good. That's good news, right? Like, David, I want to take you hunting. Good news. I, it didn't, you didn't have to tell me everything that was going to happen. You just had to tell me like this. And Jesus coming back, good news. I don't need to sit there and explain that in long detail. Heaven's going to be better than earth. I'm ready. Whenever you are, yes, Lord. So this morning, I simply want to talk about reinforce it. Now, that seems like a simple enough word, but uh, last Saturday, me and my family went to Galveston. We're going down to Galveston, and if anyone's been on 45 South uh, in the last 10 years, <laughs> there's road work, and I mean lots of it. And so everywhere you go, there's bridges, right? And I'm looking at all these bridges, and on the side of all these bridges, there's rebar everywhere, Tommy. I mean, everywhere you look, there's just pieces of rebar, right? On the side of the highway, there's asphalt everywhere. They got asphalt little uh, places that they're making the asphalt to be able to put on the roads, cement factories. Everything's just getting set up right on the side of the road. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, Man, that's uh, that's uh, crazy. Like how we can just take like a whole cement factory and just make it on the side of a road now, yeah. right? And I'm thinking, wow, man, cement's so strong, right? I mean, like cement in and of itself. Like I don't want to punch it. I know that. I it's harder than my hand. So I'm looking at cement, and cement was made for a good thing. But one thing I found out about cement is even though it was made to be walked on, drive on. Outside of it being reinforced, something else being added to it, it will crumble under the everyday life and everyday traffic that it was intended to be able to withstand. And so if we don't learn to reinforce our lives with the things that God put in this, and guess what? We're going to crumble under the everyday traffic that is life. <laughs> that is life, right? We have life, and we have a life more abundant, but we also have life getting through it. There are some days that you simply just... <laughs> I'm treading water today. <laughs> I made it. Thank you, Jesus. I'm laying down to go to sleep because tomorrow's hopefully better. And so uh, this morning, I simply want to talk about reinforcement. Reinforce simply means to strengthen or support an object or a substance, especially with additional material. With m additional material. Something has to be added to it. For it to be reinforced. When you're doing concrete, there's rebar, but there's also fiber, right? And they'll put fiber into concrete to make it stronger. And at the pressure that they're willing to make it, the hotter it gets, the more it expands. There's a lot of stuff that goes, there's science, they're concrete. It's not just water stuff, good. No, I mean, there's a true science. And anybody that works in the oil field or any other field that has to deal with this, you begin to realize, like, there's pressures that they make these at, there's fibers, there's all kinds of different ways of making this thing to be the best that it can be for the purpose that I called it to. And some things in our lives were meant to be made to a higher pressure. Right. So we need to add more stuff so that it can withhold a greater pressure in our tires. We have a little Ferrari. The Ferrari doesn't need as much PSI in the tires as a big rig. Why? Because it's not hauling what a big rig was meant to haul. 
So its tires don't need as much pressure inside to withstand the pressure that's going to be applied to it. Right? Pastor did a message uh, two Father's Day ago. And it was talking about pressure in the tire. And he gave us all little pressure sticks, right? And, it, and as soon as you hit it, bam, it lets you know what the pressure is. The problem is, in our lives, if we can't withstand the pressure on the outside, it causes us to deflate. Now we can't do anything that we were intended to do because the pressure got too great. So how do we do that? One, we got to add air, right? we got to add a substance to something else to make it greater. So a tire, it's just air. Simple. This is a pretty simple concept. Just air. That's easy. But a lot of times we will go from time to time to time without getting filled up, without getting that very thing that we need to withstand. What is that? Okay, so first, Joseph, two weeks ago, talked about love and, and what it meant and how the world has really perverted the concept of love. And how do we know that? As soon as we say love the first thing that people think about, and this is a problem, is romance. Romance in and of itself isn't love because there's a lot of TV and a lot of stories being written about romance and they ain't in love. They in lust and they in a lot of things. They in feeling. They, in, they are not in love, right? And so Joseph talked about how him and his wife were very compatible and also that she added to him. And I thought, hey, there we go. Now we're talking. So my wife doesn't just complete me. She can't complete me, but she definitely adds to me, right? If nothing else, she adds beauty to me because Lord knows I could use a little more age. But in all reality, I'm going to get them in this morning. Listen, I'm gonna, my wife's going to know she's beautiful by the time I leave this place. But I'm going to tell you, she adds to my life. The things that I lack in, a lot of times, sh she compliments me. She adds to me, right? When my kids are being bad and I just want to snatch them up by the back of the head and be like, listen, child, you go going to listen. Mama, she's going to have another approach, right? A little softer approach, right? Daddy's not that soft. I try to be at times, but sometimes I'm like, child, cry one more time, and I'm going to throat chop you. Like, that's it. I'm done. And mama's got more patience than daddy. She can deal with a lot more than that. And so they're whining, they're crying. And then, but here's what happens. Then mama gets to the place that mama's like, okay, everybody getting throat chopped, daddy included. So then... <laughs> Daddy have to come along and say, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> okay, let's everybody settle down, right? And so what do we do? We add to one another. But I want to I wanna explain something. Love is not just between a man and a woman. Now, I know a lot of people just went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't say romance. Again, if we have a perverted thought of what love is, then we're missing it to start with. Right. I can have a plutonic relationship with Joe and never have one romantic feeling toward him. I don't care what these people coming along and saying, oh, David and Jonathan, give me a break. I can have a friend that I'm in covenant with that I never had one romantic feeling toward. I can have a girlfriend, Jill, whoever, and not have a single romantic feeling toward, but still love them with the love of God. Still have a straight up relationship with them that I'm willing to die for if that comes to pass, right. right? And so we need to, like Joseph said, redefine what love is. And by redefining it, then what we're doing is solidifying it. We're reinforcing that very nature that is very much human nature. God said it's not good for you to be alone, okay? You should be in love or in covenant with somebody. Right? And so he makes Eve. Eve comes along. She's a whoa man. She's way better than man was. Right? <laughs> no, not really. But they were equals. They were of each other. They were of the side so that they weren't of the feet or of the head. Right? So they were equals. They were on the same level, which is important to remember. So many times we're like, oh, no, women should be this or men should be this, blah, blah, blah. No. Listen, God pulled her out of the side so that we're at the same level. When me and my wife stand next to each other, our hips are pretty close. They're of the same level. Even though she's much shorter than me, still pretty close, right? So first is relationships. I want to I talk to you. 2 Peter 1, 5 
through 9. And again, this is one of my favorite scriptures. It's a scripture that I believe that if I simply take these four scriptures, five scriptures, if I take them and apply them, I've encompassed a large portion of the Bible. And so that's why I, fir I stand firm to him. It says, but also this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to. What is reinforce? It simply means to strengthen or support, especially with add material. Right? So there. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For these things are yours and abound. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that which he was cleansed from in his old sins. When you read that and you realize, man, if I would just learn these six, seven things, all of a sudden, man, I'm going to start encompassing that which God has called me to, that which I was created for, that I don't have to need five million do's and don'ts. I just got this one verse. Here's an easier one. Love your brother as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. And what did Jesus say? If you do this, you will not break any of the commandments. Yeah, come on. What did Jesus do? He came along to make it way easier. The, the Pharisees had complicated and made everything about rules and regulations. Jesus said it's not about the things you can't do. It's about the things you can do. That was the difference with Jesus and the rest of the world and the rest of the world systems. The world system says law and regulation. Jesus said love. Love transcends law and regulation because if I'm truly in love with my wife, I don't do stupid things, right? Truly in love. Now, what does that mean? That means I don't look at other women. Easy, right? It means I don't think about other women. Easy, right? Well, yeah. If I'm truly in love with her, if I'm actively pursuing a relationship that's going to change my life, then it's very easy not to do those things. Right, H? Like in our lives, we know, obviously, men are stimulated by their eyes. We walk through the mall, blah, blah, blah. Something comes along. It's easy for me to see it and look away real quick. Why? Because my wife is right here. Because I can promise you I ain't never been in the mall without my wife. Not one time. Don't, not going to happen. <laughs> Tommy said amen. So when I'm in the mall, it's easy, right? When I, Anywhere, Walmart, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because when my eyes are so fixed on my wife, nothing else is going to distract me. Nothing else. So the Bible talks about if, if I'm a dead man to sin, what does that mean? Well, if I'm dead in sin... So, and I've said this before, but I want you guys to hear it again, because I believe that that's how we learn. So, if a dead man is in a coffin, what can he be tempted by? Nothing. If I'm dead to sin, then I can't be tempted by anything. And that's what the problem is. We say, oh man, I'm just so tempted by this. I'm like, well, then I got a real easy explanation. You've not died to yourself, and you've not died to that sin. That's just the reality. Now, that's a harsh word because it's too black and white, and we don't always like black and white. We like a lot of that gray area. But the truth is, if I'm still struggling with something, and I can't get over that thing, it's because I've not died to it yet. And so I need to go to the Lord and say, listen, Lord, I genuinely, 100%, need you in this area. And if I'm not actively doing that, then my relationship with my king is being altered. That very relationship that now, okay, my, I have a relationship with my wife. That's horizontal. I have a relationship with H and Tom, Tommy and the many of y'all, and that's horizontal, right? These are the, the relationship. But I also have a vertical relationship with the king. And when I have that vertical relationship, if I'm allowing little G gods into my life, G Joseph talked about that last week, right? If I'm allowing little G gods, the littlest things in our life, to consume my life instead of pursuing and passionately the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one I'm going to be with forever. But instead, we got, like Joseph said, on the little blue rope, 
He's got a, a giant rope, and he's got a piece of rope about this big that was blue. I'm helping H because he wouldn't hear. So he had a piece of rope, and it was blue. It's like this much of a tin. He said, this represents life, right? It represents life, and our life on this planet is very short in a blink of an eye. And, and those that are older, one thing I've learned, and I, I was telling my buddy Mitch the other day, I said, one thing that I genuinely want to learn from anybody that's done life more than me is this one concept. They say, David, before you know it. And I can tell you, talk to anybody that's over 45 or 50, they're going to tell you every single, unanimously, every single, David, before you know it. David, before you know it. And so I begin to apply that, David, before you know it, principle to my life, and I'm saying, okay, look, I'm going to be as intentional with my relationships because re people are the greatest commodity in all of the planet. How do I know that? Very simple. Let my daughter get kidnapped today, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, like days in a man amount of money that I would not spend. I would spend H's money to get my daughter back. Okay, listen, why? Because people are the greatest. We always act like bunny and cars. That isn't mean nothing because I would give up every single one of my cars. I would give up every single one of my guns. Every, whatever I have, I would give it up today, right now, in that very moment because people are the greatest commodity on planet Earth. They're the most valued. Why? Because the greatest commodity in the universe was willing to step out of heaven, come down to earth, so that he could buy the greatest commodity on earth, right? Which was us. We are the greatest commodity on this planet. We're what's carrying out the very will of God. Come on. So in order for that heaven to be on earth, it has to come through us. That's the way God created it. So relationships are one of the Greatest things that you could ever put your mind, your heart, your soul into because it's the only thing that's going to return something to your life. I can do business transactions that go bad. I promise you, you can have people transactions that go bad, but it was still not in vain because it lives on forever, right? Because at the day of their meeting Jesus, they're going to have to go back to that time where they said, man, I shouldn't have done H wrong that way. I shouldn't have done Tony wrong that way. And what's going to happen is they're going to be made right in that moment simply because the greatest thing that they were ever created to do was to be in relationship with other people. So relationships is huge for me. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of a friend. Proverbs 27, 17. Uh, people are the greatest resource on the planet. Think about how much stuff would get done if no people lived here. <laughs> it would just keep, like, being, right? But all of a sudden, you want a building built. You can get all the robots in the world. Get up to the 15th story and get that cement poured on there without some humans. Good luck. And guess how that robot came to be? Humans. So look, we can, we can act like all these things are great and all these things. But look, humankind is the greatest thing on this planet, bar none, hands down. That's why Jesus himself came to this planet for us. Faithful. Okay, so relationships we want to talk about love one of the things that we have to learn as believers especially tough love oh now that's a dirty word i know that uh one of the greatest theologians of all times not really uh but one of the greatest theological understandings i ever got was from garth brooks <laughs> everybody said what <laughs> Some of the God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Can you imagine the world if God said yes to everything we ever asked for? <laughs> us in our beautiful selfish ways, us in our beautiful lack of understanding of the end from the beginning, and we said, oh God, you know, if only I could win the lottery. Oh, I'd be so much better. You can't afford $1,000 a month, but now all of a sudden you want to be able to think you can afford, you can understand and be able to manage million dollars a month. Not going to happen, Jack. Doesn't work that way. 
right? And so it's amazing. The greatest, I'm telling you, like when I thought about this song, I was, I was, I was probably 22 years old, probably somewhere right in there. Moved to Oklahoma. I'm all by myself. I don't have friends. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have nothing. I felt like I lived with my parents. And I'm going, God, what was I created for? I hate this life. <laughs> Why am I here? What am I doing? This is, and then all of a sudden, like it was one day, I'm driving by myself and I hear that song. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of truth to that. Like, I ain't going to base my theology on Garth Brooks especially with his Bud Light drinking self. But I can tell you this, like, I can tell you this. I, that's truth to that. Because why? Because we're so dang selfish that if I got everything I ever asked for, if, if as a daddy, this is a good example, as a daddy, my kids came up to me, JJ, she doesn't have full understanding yet, right? So full understanding means that I have a lot of area that I can hurt myself in. That's all that that means. It says, oh, there's a lot of area I can hurt myself in. Business, whatever. Life, doesn't matter, right? If she wants to be able to drive a car, Pastor uses this analogy a lot. I'll use it. If she wants to drive the car today, I flip her the keys, she takes off in a van. What's going to happen? The other side of the van is going to look like the other side of the van, right? It's going to be all smashed up. It's going to be beat up. Why? Because she doesn't have the capacity to be able to operate that thing at that moment, and yet she's asking for it. And if I'm a bad dad, I'm like, yeah, baby, go ahead. Good luck. And how many times are we like, God, I just need a new job. And God's going, bro, I put you at that place so that you can win them people there. Bro, I put you at that place because that's where you're at right now. You need to mature more. You need to learn more in order to occupy a new place. But yet we're still going, I just need this. I just want this. And he's going, bro, you're not there yet. You can't do that yet. You'll hurt yourself. You'll hurt others if you get there. And again, God loves everybody so much that in his infinite wisdom and his infinite knowledge, he says no. Tough love is one of the hardest things that we can learn, especially as parents. My kids ask me for stuff and I want to be like, yes, and Holy Spirit, a.k.a. Tony's like, mm -mm. no ice cream tonight. <laughs> they just want some ice cream, baby. It's fine. Nope. Mm -mm. They're already jumping off the couch. They're going to break their arm. Okay. I won't. Right? Because we will ask for things that we simply aren't ready for or that we don't understand. And so the greatest thing that in our lives that we can ever learn is tough love. Especially, like I said, as a daddy, as a mom. Like, that tough love, I, I'm going to be honest, my wife will tell you, I'm a yes guy. My kids want it, I'm like, I got it? You can have it. Like, I don't care. Like, yeah, absolutely. But mama, she's a little more level. And so she's like, nah, they don't need that. Okay. You're right. <laughs> so, tough love is something we have to learn. If we're going to love one another, why? Because faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? One of the greatest ways I've ever learned, ever learned, is because somebody that loved me came up and told me that I was doing something wrong. <laughs> really. Like, if somebody that genuinely loved me now, again, unwarranted advice always comes off as criticism right so if i didn't ask for it probably don't want to hear it but if i'm coming to you and i'm saying man you know what and this is funny because this is a true story i talked to pastor the other day and he was talking about me and joseph and he said he said yeah don't worry he said when i get back i'm gonna critique everything that you and joseph were talking about and everything you did and i'm like at first why because my flesh is gonna be like no no no, no i don't need that but in, in all actuality, if I want to do this, if I want to carry on with this, what do I got to do? I better shut up and listen. Yeah. I better sit down and say, okay, teach me. You've done this for 35 or 40 years. I bet you might have something to teach me, yeah. right? And so if I just shut up and get out of my own way, maybe I'll get a little better, yeah. right? Yeah. And so what do I do? Okay, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Think about this this verse right here. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. How many people will come up to us, blow smoke up our, and just say, oh man, you were the best, you're the greatest. Guess how much I learned from that? Zero. Guess how much better that made me? None. But that's what we love because Facebook's full of it, I guarantee you. And this is not a slight against anybody, but you're going to get out of here today. People are like, oh, it was a great word. It's amazing. People are like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And the truth is, that didn't help me. That didn't make me better. It made me feel good. I smiled. 
But the truth is, it didn't make me a better communicator. It didn't make me a better pastor. It didn't make me a better anything, really. But yet, that's what we're going to flock to, because that's the easy side. That's what makes us feel good. And so be careful the kisses of an enemy, because they will lie to you, and they will keep you at the same place you're at right now. Get around somebody who can tell you the truth, because I promise you, that makes you a better person. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. That's a tough one. Like, especially open. Like, open means there might be other people around. And that's the big one. My daughter, this is the big one for her, right? I get on to her. JJ, you can't do that when people are around. Right, people around. JoJo and, and Talia at the house. I get on to her. Why? I hurt her feelings, right? Other people heard daddy get on to her. But that's because I love her so much that I'm not willing to let company keep me from an opportunity to discipline her in such a way it's going to make her a better JJ because that's what's most important to me. Keeping friends is important, but making sure my daughter's going to be successful in life. Sorry, bro, you're going to have to listen to me get on to my daughter for about five seconds. And you're going to either have to deal with her or go home. That's simple. You don't live far. Bye. <laughs> My, the most important thing in my life is my relationships, bar none. My relationships on this planet are the greatest commodity that I have. I found them to be the greatest opportunity for success. I found them to be the greatest opportunity for uh, trying to figure out my own life, right? When I'm getting ready to write this sermon, what am I doing? I'm bouncing off my wife, bouncing off Jojo, calling pastor. Hey, what do you think about these things? Oh, man, that's good. One of the things with, with reinforcing it is reinforcing isn't always seen. The rebar in the concrete isn't seen, but it's essential. The discipline behind closed doors is essential if we want to build relationships in our life. Next is faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What does that mean? Okay, it's very simple. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Okay, so what is the word of God? Is it? Is it? No, it's not, right? Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ is the living incarnate Word of God. This right here is simply pointing to the Word of God. And if we're not careful, we'll sit there and we'll read this thing, and we'll be like, okay, yes. Now, don't get me wrong. The Holy Scriptures is the Holy Spirit speaking to a man or a woman at a time that was necessary for them to be able to take these principles that were founded on what? That the very cornerstone. What did Jesus say to Peter? On this rock, what was the rock? That Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he was going to be crucified and that he was going to rise again and that he was going to ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father. So if we're not careful, what happens is we read this, but we forget to do this. Why? Because there is a rhema word of God that was intended for your everyday life. Joseph began to mention it last week. That is when I get alone in my secret place, when I get alone in my alone time, that I'm getting a rhema word of God so that I can fulfill the very purpose on my life. If I'm not careful, what I'll do is I'll get so stagnant and I'll get into religion because that's what this thing can produce if we're not careful because we'll take one verse Oh, Peter was the bishop. Peter was the first, was the first uh, leader of the church. Oh, no, uh, uh James was. Look at this verse. Now, all of a sudden, you got two denominations that are arguing over who was the first leader of the church. Give me a break. Who cares? How did that affect my salvation today? None. None. Didn't affect me at all. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the word of God. Come on. Jesus is the one. He's the author and finisher of my faith. I don't need to worry about who was the first bishop of the church. I need to worry about, can I get myself right enough today that if he comes back, that I'm good? That's what I need to worry about. And so, uh, call to me, and I will answer you and show you you are great, mighty things which you do not know. I need this for my everyday walk. 
This gives me wisdom. It gives me understanding. It gives me perspective. But if I'm not going to the living king, the one that wrote this, the one that inspired this, the one that's in my life trying to give me daily instruction, then I'm missing half of it. Why? Because it said the sword is like a two-edged sword, right? The word is a two-edged sword. What is it? It's both the written and the spoken word. If I don't have that other side, my edge isn't very sharp. It's not cutting through the bone and the marrow. It's not cutting through the spirit. It's not cutting through because I haven't sharpened it to have my ear to be able to listen to the king. Because instead, all I did was through my own mind, I said, okay, yep, okay, yep. And if I'm not letting the Holy Spirit speak to me through this and in my prayer time, I'm a one-edged sword and I'm not very effective. And I'm not affecting the people around me. And it's not getting inside of me to the place that it's like, like they said, it's like a fire in my bones. I can't even hold it back. I got to tell somebody. But instead, it's like, eh. yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to that church on, you know, most Sundays. And if we're not careful, we are that person. So easy to fall in that trap. So our faith, we must add to our faith. Like I said in the beginning, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. It always goes back to love. It always goes back to why? Because love, hope, and faith, and of these, what's the greatest? Love. So as much as I have to have faith in order to please the king, I have to have faith. He said, it is impossible to please me without faith. But he also said, if you're doing all this stuff and you're not doing it in love, what are you doing? It's like banging cymbals. Banging cymbals. Man, I don't want to be a banging cymbal. Like, I love the drums, but dang, just hit that cymbal the whole time. Bang, 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 bang. Pretty soon people are going to be like, oh, that guy. That guy. (laughs) And how we've all been around that guy, right? It's like the one that just doesn't have love and what he's saying doesn't have the, the very nature of God and what he's saying. And all of a sudden you're going, okay, bro, you can go. I'm like, yeah, I get it. You love Jesus. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. You may want to go back and read the thing, figure out what it is he's saying, right? So the, the greatest thing in our life is love. The next greatest thing that we have to make sure we're reinforcing is our faith. We must reinforce the very faith because, like I said, it's impossible to please God without faith. We must, we must please our king. Last I want to talk about is reinforcing the church. And I'm going to, real quick. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And when he tells you these things to come, He will tell you the things to come. So in our minds, he's already told us what? That nothing can prevail against the gates of the church, right? The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. If we're not careful, what we'll do is uh, Jesus came and at the one of his last words to the disciples, go ahead, Josiah. One of his last words to the disciples was simply this. Go into the world and make disciples. Why did he say make disciples? Because the first one, relationship. But two, if we think about this from a correct standpoint, Jesus didn't say go make churches. Now the Western world says go make churches. The Western world says make bigger buildings, make more pews, make greater parking, make the best kids place you can make and people will come. And the truth is the word of God is very specific on this. If we build people, we'll never have to build churches. It's going to happen. Whether you want it to or not, the byproduct of building people is you will not be able to not have churches. It's going to happen. I don't need a building to have church. I am the church. Come on. I was created to be the church every single place I go. This was created so that we could be strengthened, so that we could be the church wherever we went. So that we could heal the blind and we could heal the sick. So that we could do the things that Jesus Christ himself was doing. Because we were the church. We're the medical team. 
we're the whatever. You can put the adjective there you want. I was called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That is the church. How do I build the church? I build people. Simple. It's just as simple. That's the easiest way I can explain it, in my own opinion. Now, you guys may have another opinion. Easiest way to build a church, build people. Joseph's doing discipleship with some of the guys. Why? Because when you begin to build people, they can build people, and they can build people, and they can build people. And all of a sudden, the residual of building people is rebuilding people. Now, all of a sudden, I don't have to worry about your stupid Facebook post because I know it's going to be good. Now I don't have to worry about crazy things you're saying because I know it's going to be good. And so I, I, I'll say this in closing. God so wants the church to be ready when he comes back. And I've said this before. Jesus Christ is not coming back when the world gets crazy. We like to believe that because it takes the responsibility off of us. As long as the world gets crazier, then all of a sudden, oh, now Jesus is coming. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear. Jesus is coming back for a spotless and wrinkleless lamb. There is no denying it. There's no getting away from it. The truth is when the church gets better, Jesus is coming back. But instead, the church has said when the world gets worse, he's going to come back and get us. No, 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 no. The responsibility needs to shift and we need to get back to the church. We need to build this thing. Why? Because people are longing and desperate to see the manifestation of the sons and the daughters of God. It's longing for us, but we have to do it. We have to be the one. And if we're not building the church, what are we building? If we're not building the kingdom, what are we building? Just saying. Just saying. I love you guys this morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to communicate this to you. I pray that you guys think about these things. Build love. Build faith. Reinforce them. Because, man, there's nothing greater on this planet than our faith and our love. And when we build those two things, the church gets built in a way that it's not seen in a long time. It's been a long time since the church was the cornerstone of our society. But we need to get back there. The responsibility simply falls on us. It falls on us. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to give this word this morning. I pray that people would take it to heart, that they would recognize that their lives are to be intentional. That it's not enough to just coast. It's not enough to flippantly read the word. It's not enough to flippantly pray. But Lord, until we stop and we say, Lord, you're more than enough, then Lord, all we're doing is coasting. Lord, you didn't create us to coast. You created us to create. You created us to be more than enough. You created us to be the very hands and feet of the one that is, to be the vessels of the Holy Spirit moving to and fro in our everyday lives. So take this very simple word, and I pray that people would apply it to their lives. Let it change hearts. Let it change minds. And more importantly, Lord, let it just shape us into being more like you. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. At this time, if I could get the servant leader.